All right. So as you can see, it's just me this week. Uh, it seems like every week we've uh, kind of dwindled down people. And I think that's probably just a testament to my uh, sparkling personality. But I want to go ahead and, and just do an episode and, and make it quick. I don't think this one will be very long, but I uh, managed to cram Lisa Frankenstein in, which uh, just dropped on Peacock. If you've got that, if you missed it in the theaters, uh, you can catch it there. It's uh, it's a fun movie. It, it's really interesting to me. It is written by Diablo Cody, um, who... I really thought had done more. And then I was looking at her bo body of work and she did Ju Juno in 2007, Jennifer's body in 2009, and then a bunch of stuff since then, but nothing I really know anything about. She did United States of Tarot, which I actually heard good things about, but I never watched. And then after that, um, just a bunch of small time stuff that I, that I haven't heard of. Um, Lisa Frankenstein came out to a uh, pretty or critics reviews. I think it was like a 51% on Rotten Tomatoes, but it did really well with the audience. And I think this depends on who is reviewing it. This is honestly, it's an interesting movie because it's all teenage characters. So it feels like it would be aimed at teenage, well, teenagers, but it's really feels like it's aimed at the Gen X crowd. This is very much an eighties movie. You're looking at something that feels like a mashup of Beetlejuice, Heathers, uh, Edward Scissorhands, you know, those kinds of movies. And, and I don't think that most people of the current teen generation would know any of those movies unless their parents forced them to watch them. And so it, the things that, uh, that it's taking from or heavily taking from are not things that that everybody would know. So the gist of this movie is it's a take on Frankenstein, right? Right, it's right there in the title. But there's this girl. She's she's been through a whole lot of trauma. Her mom was killed, and she was in the house. She didn't see it, but she heard it. And so, oh, and I should say before getting too far into this, this is a a romantic horror comedy. Definitely heavier on the comedy. Uh, the romance is there but it sort of serves the comedy and the horror aspect of it and it takes some good turns i mean it definitely ends in a good spot but i don't want to ruin the ending so i'll try not to say anything about that the gist of it is after her mother is killed uh, her dad remarries and he marries a character played by carla gugino and she is awful like she's the worst like she's kind of the wicked stepmother of the story right and she's got a daughter who is you know as the the film starts uh, the daughter's name is Taffy, and she's really, she's kind of like the the bimbo cheerleader character, and she's, I mean, she's sweet, but you get, you know, you, you really expect her to be kind of the movie's villain, like she gives the characters Lisa, Lisa Swallows, which is an unfortunate name, I think, I don't know why they came up with that, but Lisa, you know, of the Lisa Frankenstein name, is, she's, she's sad, and so Taffy, the character that is her stepsister, gives her clothes and, and all this stuff. And the way that they kind of talk about it and they frame it, you, you can't quite tell if she's doing it to be nice or if she's doing it out of pity or if she's doing it to be like kind of a bitch. You just can't really tell. And and so as the story goes on, we find out that, that Taffy actually is a great person or at least for the most part, a really good person. Like she's trying really hard to take care of this girl that came into her life that has been through some stuff and needs a friend, needs a sister, needs somebody to take care of her. And she really does. Uh, and she, she, just, she just does a lot. She, she cares a lot for, uh, for Lisa. And, and so it's, it's, you kind of don't figure it out for a while, but once you figure it out and look back, it's really sweet. Like she just, she's just kind, like she's not super sharp. She's a cheerleader. You know, she's, you know, our main character, Lisa is, is more studious and she is, you know, she's into, interested in the head of the lit department at the school. And so she's got a crush on him and that's kind of, you know, where the story starts, you know, she's got a crush on this dude. She wants to flirt with him or whatever. So she goes to a party that they're at. Um, she's not too successful with it. And this other guy kind of takes her into a back room and feels her up and, makes her feel really crappy about herself. And also at this party, she drank some spiked punch. So she's super high and she goes into this graveyard and she's sitting there with at this grave that she's been visiting regularly because it has a cool bust on it. She doesn't know anything about it, about the person. This person's been there forever. But in her 
drugged up and drunken stupor, she is complaining to this, basically this gravestone and, and saying, you know, just kind of how miserable everything is and all that. And so she goes home and and has a really shitty night and passes out. Well, when she wakes up the next morning, uh, they find out that lightning has struck in the graveyard that she was at. And it turns out the lightning struck this grave and brought this character played by Cole Sprouse, Dylan Sprouse, one of the Sprouses, Cole Sprouse. And so he, you know, he he comes to find her because, he, you know, effectively you know, through whatever magic this story is using, he is brought back to life for the purpose of fulfilling her wish or or to help her be in love. And so as the story starts to go on, we find out when he comes out of the ground, obviously he's super like zombified and he's missing a hand and in and, and like a bunch of his his body isn't working. And so the the stepmom who really, really sucks, she's the worst, starts just going off on on Lisa because she's been through some bad stuff. You know, she's not a she's not a bad girl, but she starts to go kind of crazy. And it seems like she's gonna attack Lisa. And and when it when it starts to go down, the, they call him the creature, played by Cole Sprouse, comes up behind the stepmom and hits her over the head and kills her. And so, you know, they collaborate to hide the body. And when they're doing that, uh, they take her ears and they put her ears on his body and come to find out that if you put those on him and then bake him in a tanning bed, I don't know why, um, he can now hear. And so they find that, you know, these body parts that aren't there. Uh, if they find body parts and put them on, much like Frankenstein, he can become more human again. And so she's sitting there, she's talking to him. There's some funny scenes, there's some inappropriate scenes, but hilarious scenes where they're kind of getting to know each other and for him to learn about the current world. And, you know, she keeps talking about this, about this guy that she's in love with and all the while, he, as the creature, is just listening and trying to help her and, and do all that, even though you can tell that, like, he wants to be with her. Like, he came back from the dead to be with her. And so she decides, once she figure, once they figure out that the body parts, when they're putting them back on, are, are effectively repairing him, she decides to go after the dude that felt her up at the party. She was just going to cut his hand off and give the hand to the creature and things kind of go sideways, and so the creature kills him after they cut off his hand. So he's got a new hand, but they have a new body died. And that's kind of how the rest of the movie goes. It's not, like, overly bloody. There's a little bit of blood here and there. Some things go screwy. You have your hijinks and all that. But it's, I mean, it's overall, it's pretty fun. I I, I read some other reviews, and, and most of the re reviews, especially the ones by regular viewers, are a lot more forgiving than the ones by critics. And this is... You know, I kind of feel like the critics are accurate. Like if, if this movie was made to target an audience of a specific age group, you know, we're talking about, like I said, the if, if you're targeting the Gen X, making it about teenagers might not work so good, or at least the references will be missed and, and, and the, the tones behind it will be missed. And if you're making it for teenagers, setting it in the 80s, I, I don't know if that works for teenagers anymore. Like I don't know if teenagers care about it, the 80s. Like, I don't think my kids would be too into this. Granted, they're boys, and this is definitely a romantic comedy, so I'd be curious to see what a teenage girl thinks about it. But for the most part, it's it feels very specific. But with that being said, I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was fun. It has a really fun ending from what I saw. If you've ever seen Notting Hill, the ending might actually feel familiar. But otherwise, you know, it's pretty straightforward. There's a little twist near the end that kind of changes a lot. And then as things continue to progress, it, it feels like it's going to end in a really dark place and then kind of comes out of it at the very end. But yeah, I mean, it's an hour and 48 minutes. It's on Peacock. It's an easy watch. If you are a Gen Xer, then I think you'll enjoy it. If you like rom-coms, you might enjoy it. But, you know, you, you have to be down for that 80s feel. And, and the character and, and the way she does things, I mean, there's definitely a Heather's feel to her character and in comparison to Winona Ryder's character, you know, she kind of gets a little darker as the thing goes on and it's neat and fun, but I mean, it, it is what it is, right? It's, it's, it's going to be fun for the right people and other people aren't going to like it on IMDb. It's a 6.1. The critics gave it a 51% on Rotten Tomatoes, but the audience scores 81%. So, I mean, to me, it sits right in that six to seven, 60%, 65% range. And I think that's, 
about right. I think mileage will vary. Uh, there's some things about it that aren't so great. I actually think Catherine Newton is fantastic. She's so quirky and weird and fun. And I, and I do think she's she's got a lot of talent and she's going to go a long way. Cole Sprouse does a good job as the creature. It's a weird part because he doesn't really have any dialogue uh, for most of the movie. And, you know, he, it's just kind of him being a zombie. And I don't know that that's necessarily a stretch of anybody's talent. I, I think a great actor probably would have portrayed some of the feelings and emotions a little better but you know he did a good job carla gugino's in it for a little bit and she does a good job uh I, the dad i feel like i've seen before but i don't know from where and the sister uh the stepsister taffy i actually like i said i really liked her the actress's name is lisa soberano and i haven't seen her in anything before looking her up on imdb like she's been in stuff that i've never heard of uh, the show called make it with you that came out in 2020 that has pretty good ratings on imdb it's an 8.2 uh she's in 45 episodes of that so she must have been a big deal but i don't know anything about it this is the first time that i really remember seeing her but i uh i i really adored her in this so i would say you know, overall, give it a watch if you are in the mood for that kind of movie. So they they build it as a horror comedy. It's not particularly scary. Uh, you know, there's death and dismemberment and a little bit of blood, but it's not over the top. Uh, I, again, like think like Beetlejuice or Heathers. Like when you think about the horror aspect of those, that's about as deep as you're going to get with this. So, you know, as long as you can handle that, I think you can, you can handle this and, and give it a go. You might not like it. Because it's on Peacock, it's really easy to just turn off. You're not wasting any money if you've already got Peacock. So give it a go and and, and hopefully you enjoy it. I was going to talk about Shogun and Invincible, uh, but Andrew's not here. And so I slacked off and finishing those. Uh, thankfully, it'll probably take a little while to get to Shogun anyways. I think Shogun has two or three more episodes to go before we're done. Uh, and so we may hold off on that until it's all over. But from what I've seen so far, I think I'm through... Five of the available six or seven episodes um and i mean it's it's, it's a fantastic show it, it is so great it's just again the, the hardest part about it is just that it's all subtitled or most of it is subtitled uh, and so you do have to pay complete attention to it but the acting is brilliant the uh the sets are great you know just the whole look and feel of it is incredible so i can't recommend it enough and and i'll get to the end of it when i get there i've been watching Invincible, there's only, if you were caught up before the new season started, it's actually only the second half of the season. So there's only four episodes. Uh, they're like 45 minutes. So I recommend that one too. I actually have one episode left on that. So I'll finish that before next week. That's one of Andrew's favorite shows. So we'll definitely talk about that. And honestly, the only other thing I've really got is a really light review of a video game. So if you're not a video gamer, you can you know, peace out now, or, or, you know, if you love the dulcet tones of my voice, uh, you can keep watching and we'll go from there. But I, I don't know if I've talked about it before, but I, uh, subscribe to Gamefly because of the way that I play video games, I kind of turn and burn play and then I'm done. I don't go back to video games a lot. And so Gamefly is really cool. It's $15 a month. If you keep a game, even for a month, month and a half, it's like 16 bucks for a game. And, you know, that if you're not going to replay it, that's a hell of a deal. And I've had months where I play two games. So now all of a sudden it's seven bucks for a game, right? Like it, when you're averaged it out. So uh, for me, it's a great deal. It really, it really pays for itself. I get a lot of uh, value out of it. And so it's been really cool. And so this month they sent me a game called Skull and Bones. Uh, and if you're a gamer and if you've ever played the Assassin's Creed game, this definitely steals a little bit from... Assassin's Creed Black Flag, which is a pirate Assassin's Creed game. And this one is primarily, if not entirely, you know, the ship-based battles, which funny enough, now granted I'm going off of memory when I'm talking about Assassin's Creed Black Flag, but this doesn't feel as good as Black Flag. I, I don't know what it is. I don't know what the difference is. Um, and again, it's probably my memory. Like I remember Black Flag being pretty great at this. Um, this is to me not quite as good, but it's it, it's all right. And, and funny enough, though, even though like I don't totally love this game, it's super addictive. I, I don't know what it is. Like 
it, it you can do some of the microtransaction stuff that I really hate to kind of get ahead or put yourself in a position where things are easier. But you, you don't really have to. You can just kind of go along with it. And then it's kind of just building your wealth and building your power of your ship or or whichever ship you're building um, and things like that. So it, it does have a story. And the story, you know, the opening scene, you're uh, on a pirate ship and your ship gets blown up. And you effectively wash up on shore with this, you know, more famous pirate. And then the whole game is you accepting missions or first half of the game is you accepting missions from him to kind of help grow his empire. You get so big and so impressive that you get shipped off to the East Indies. Uh, This all takes place in the Indian Ocean uh, between Africa and India. The, The map is definitely smaller than that like to for you to get to the east indies from africa uh it would definitely take you longer than it takes in the game obviously but it that those are kind of the locations you go through and so you get sent across to the east indies you get another pirate queen this time who is trying to get you to do some stuff she gives you a handful of missions and then you're done kind of with the main story and then you're on to you know like i said this whole kind of wealth building concept where you're a smuggler and you're doing stuff and and there are all these little side missions and you've got to make enough money so that you can fund your like your illegal goods operations so that you can get coins so you can improve your stuff but you can use those coins to improve your smuggling operations and then this is, it's a whole cycle uh, and it's it, it's really wild because it should not be as like sustainable as it is but I, I really like I'll sit down and I'll play it for two and three hours and, and not even know what that I'm you know, that I've thrown away this time. And one thing about it that's interesting is it's going to be done in seasons, kind of like something like Fortnite. Now, I don't know. It doesn't seem like you're going to have to pay for those seasons, but you do have to wait for them to come out. The current one has just under two months left on it. So, you know, you have time. There's leaderboards. I forgot to say it is a, it's an online game in that, you know, other people are playing and they're, they're in the same, you know, little world as you. Uh, the one that I'm in, I really don't see a ton of people. I see somewhere between what feels like five and 10 people, you know, in the entire time that I'm on there. Um, so it doesn't seem overcrowded. I don't know how they're doing that, but there is a leaderboard so you can compare, you know, the things you're doing to other people and things like that. It's not a player versus player thing. So there are things that you do that will enable that. And then you have to fight other players and you can sort of evaluate those before you get involved and go in and get your own ass kicked, you know, but you're not forced into PVP unless you choose the things that require it. And they tell you outright if they're going to. So it's not, you get surprised by it. Um, Usually if your boat gets sunk, if your ship gets sunk, you can go back to the location you were at and pick up your stuff. I've had two instances where that didn't work and I was kind of pissed about it, but it's not the end of the world. You still get to keep your boat. You just don't have all the stuff that you had on it. But yeah, it's fun. It's not as pretty as as it should be for a a game of this generation, I don't think. It's not as complex. Like a lot of, it's a pretty basic game. And, And honestly, maybe that's what makes it so playable is that it's just, it's not reinventing the wheel. It's not asking you to do anything complicated. It just wants you to go out and be a pirate. And so, you know, when you start to run low on money, you can accept missions and things like that. But you can also just sail the seas and blow up the non-player boats and hope that you don't anger too many of them where you get in a fight that you can't win. Um, But there, you know, there's all kinds of little aspects to it. There's, uh, you know, there's these, what is it? The There's a Dutch company in the East Indies that you can fight. There's... Uh, all these like tribes people in, in the African side that you can fight and you can do missions for them too. Uh, if you piss them off, they'll start looking for you and try and kill you. Then there's various pirates and various captains and things like that that are out there that you can go up against. And some of them are harder than others. Uh, you know, some of them are really hard. Some of them you should avoid at least for a long, you know, for, for most of the beginning, if not most of the game. Some of them really require you to find somebody Um, that's online at the same time so you can take them down together there's a few that are just 
really, really hard. And you've got to be able to do that and or just avoid them until you decide you're ready to do that. I don't really like playing with people very much. So I haven't done a couple of the ones that are really big and beefy. And some of the ones that become PvP, I've been very specific about the ones that I do. Because if it's something where I'm attacking a town, right? So you're, 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 you're bombing a town or you're, what do they call it? It's, it's not plundering a fort. There's a different term for it that I can't remember. There is plundering and you can do that. And that's actually not player versus player. Other players can show up and help you do it. Um, and you get some benefits out of that, but there's other missions where you're trying to take over these forts in a different way. And those ones become player versus player. And basically whoever survives till the end and, it goes by percentage, and I don't know entirely what it bases that on. I think some of it, I think most of it is if you take damage or or how much damage you deal to the enemy and the other players that that are you know on the server, the more damage you deal, the ha- the higher the faster your percentage goes, and the first person to one hundred percent gets to keep this this base, and you can get sunk by other players because only one person can get it. So whereas in the the other plundering, everybody works together and then everybody basically gets the full rewards for it. In this one, only one person gets the benefit of it. So you, you know, you, you want to win. You don't want to be the weakest one. You want to be out there kicking ass. And so it's, uh, it's interesting. It's not, Again, it's not complicated. It's not reinventing the wheel. It's not amazing. It's not the best game I've ever played, but it is somehow like magically addicting. Uh, I, I haven't really been able to give it up. And when I have the free time, I've been playing it. So that speaks to something, you know, I'm not going to put as many hours into it as I did Final Fantasy VII Rebirth and, you know, things like that. And I'm looking forward to, you know, finishing this game or ready to be, you know, being done with this game. Uh, crazy enough it's expensive like if i were to keep it or try and buy it i think the the full version of it is like 90 bucks i mean that's the deluxe edition or whatever but i think if you get the regular edition i think it's 70 so it's not a cheap game i'm playing on the playstation 5 i looked it up to double check it's not on game pass so if you want it on xbox you're paying for it there um and so you know uh, I would say if you are part of a rental service like I am, rent it, see if you like it, and then maybe buy it. But I don't know. I it, It's doing okay. I think its Metacritic scores are all right. Um, it, it's relatively su- successful. From what I hear, it's going to get its second season. Like they're, they're putting the work into it, so it'll keep going. It doesn't seem like it's been hampered by the game uh, company layoffs and things like that. So we'll see. But, you know... It, it is fun. Like I said, it's not perfect. It's not great, but it is fun. And, and that's what keeps me playing right now. Like when I have the time, uh, I'm in there doing it. So uh, Skull and Bones, uh, if it's your jam, if, you know, sea piracy sounds like your jam, go give it a shot. You can only, you know, build your your ship and your, and your stuff up so far uh, before you kind of max out right now. I assume when the next season comes out, they'll kind of raise level caps and things like that and make it easier or or make it so that you can continue. They may, may reset everything. I don't know how the season thing's going to work, so we'll find that out. But I, I'd say give it a shot if it sounds interesting at all. Know that you don't get off the boat really to do anything interesting other than accept missions and drop things off and, and do some, like, little things, but there's no, there's no human combat. There's no human, um, anything. And you don't really get much of it. The real action is on the boat. Um, so that's skull and bones. And I mean, that's all I've really got. Like, I know that I watched some other stuff this week and I can't think of what it is uh, and it doesn't bode well for whatever it was. So, uh, I can't really recommend anything. So I would say, Check out Lisa Frankenstein if you're a gamer and you've got some time and you've got the the money. Check out Skull and Bones, and otherwise, next week. And I feel like I've said this like four times in a row, but next week Andrew will be here, so you won't be stuck with just me. I think that uh, Lauren will be back next week too. She was going to be here tonight, but she was just exhausted and and, and couldn't make it, and, and that's okay. Andrew had a lot going on, and he was kind of in the same boat where he was just burnt out, and. Uh, you know, as the de facto leader of this 
little podcast that could, you know, I hung out and, and wanted to get something together. And thankfully, uh, I, I saw that Lisa Frankenstein dropped. If I had had a little more time, there's a horror flick on Peacock called Night Swim that I want to check out. So I'll maybe try and get that done before next week. The other thing I did watch this week, uh, and it'll be a brief review, if a review at all, but I watched the original The Omen because the, what is it, the first Omen, is that what it's called, um, is in theaters right now. And I realized that The Omen is a horror movie gap that I have as somebody who enjoys horror films, reads horror novels, things like that. I kind of felt like it was important to see the movie. And so I watched the original 70s The Omen uh, with Gregory Peck. and. I was instantly reminded how different horror is today than it was then. The things that I hated the first time I watched The Exorcist uh, are very present in The Omen. It's just, it's super slow. It's all mood and uh, kind of like character angst. Like it's it's really not that bad. And, and by today's standards and by things, it's, it's not that scary. I, I think the kid... You know, if it was being made today, the kid would be a better actor, even though he's only like five, I think. Um, like he's not old enough to be a good actor, but you would need a better actor for it to really work. Um, it's, you know, the whole gist of it is, yeah, he's he's supposed to be uh, the beast, you know, son of the devil and all that. And that just doesn't doesn't really play for me. And maybe it's just because I'm not, you know, Catholic. I think this is pre-satanic panic right so like when you're talking about evil and uh demons and the devil and things like that i think people were genuinely scared of that in the 70s like that was a scary thing a scary idea um, and i don't think it's as scary today we've seen so many movies about it and so many things about it that uh, i think we're kind of numb to it you know you can watch the conjuring franchise and just be like, cool, that's that's uh, that's a scary ghost stories or whatever. But, you know, it's not that much. You know, recently they've, they did the, ex what, the, the, the most recent Exorcist movie. There was an Exorcist TV show, you know, that's out there. I actually, having rewatched the original Exorcist uh, last year, I actually liked that a lot more the second time around. And I liked it a lot more than The Omen. The Omen is a 7.5 on IMDb, and on Rotten Tomatoes, it's an 85 from the critics and 81 from the audience. For me, it's it's less than that. I I, I was just kind of bored. It's really slow, um, and you know it does have suspense and it builds all towards that, and you know and, and all that jazz. But I mean, for me, that the, the fears aren't there, and, and that may just be me. Um, I mean, it must just be me, right? Because generally speaking, everybody likes it more than I do. Uh, but you know, I, I'm definitely curious for for the new one, the, the first omen. It's doing okay. That one's got a 77% from the critics and 64% from the audience. Um, I'm a big fan of um, the girl that is playing the the nun in this one in in the first omen. Uh, her name is Nell Tiger Free. She was in she was in Servant on Apple TV, which is a, a good creepy. Uh, series so you know she's got the pedigree for it so i'm really curious to see if the, how this is but i first omen i won't see it till comes it comes out but between now and then i'm going to watch you know omen two three and four and then the remake of the omen from 2006 with leaf schreiber um but i don't know that i'll talk about them i don't know that i liked this one enough to be an omen fan so we shall see but um you know, if if you're getting ready to go watch the first Omen, maybe give, you know, the original Omen a shot and see how it all lines up. I, I think that, that the first Omen is a legitimate prequel to the Omen. So I think the things that happen in that movie um, are tied to uh, the things that will happen in the first Omen. So with that, that's all I've got. I'm out of gas. I got nothing left. It's my bedtime. If you stuck it this far, I really appreciate it. Next week, I, I swear, I promise, we're going to have more people. We'll do better. Um, and, uh, and so have a great week, and we'll see you next time.